Can we work it out? Only time will tell It's gonna take a lot Cause we've been through hell I can't be without you I've tried and I failed So can we work it out? Only time will tell Why do you, why do you keep telling me nothing? But I know all your flaws, at least they say something Still I try to connect with you through your eyes Your Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Life Well Lived by Amabila Steven. It's an engaging and enlightening talk show on life, relationships, and the business of life. Grab a cup of juice and just chill. Life Well Lived by Amabila Steven. Live life. Live fully. So now, um, the question is, how important is um, being happy uh, and fulfilled with what you're doing? I know some people are happy a while, some are not. On today's show, I'll be focusing on having you know, a fulfilling career, being happy and successful at the same time. I have an expert on today's show who is going to be doing justice or tearing this topic into pieces. Welcome with me on Live Wally by Mobile Steven, Terry McDowell. Um, hi, Amabola. How are you today? I'm really doing great. How are you today also? I, I'm, I'm really doing um, great, and I'm really happy to be here on your show with you. All right. Thank you so much once again. Um, ter now, Terry Maduha is an executive and career coach. She's also a speaker and a best-selling author of Winning the Game of Work, Career Happiness and Sources on Your Own Terms. Welcome once again. Thanks, Amabola. I'm looking forward to our conversation. All right. Now, now I wanted to meet you. Can you um, tell me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm an executive and career coach and an author. I'm also uh, a wife and a mother of three children ages uh, 17 to 23. Uh, before I got into coaching full time, I was a marketing executive in a financial services firm. I had actually a long career in the corporate world before I uh, sort of took a, a pivot in my own career and started helping others become happier and more successful in their own careers. Oh, great. Now, so can we talk about um, Terry B. McDowell coaching? Um, sure, yeah. I, um, I work with really people in three different scenarios. One is uh, a group of people that I would call successful but not satisfied. If you were to look at their accomplishments on paper, you'd say, wow, you know, they got great jobs, work for great companies, the, you know, high level titles, making a lot of money, but a lot of times they're paying a very high price for that success. They're feeling stressed and burnt out. Maybe that's bleeding over into their health or relationships. And so what I really try to help people do is step back and maybe restructure how they're doing things or um, develop skills that will help them be more successful and, and more satisfied in their career. So basically have that balance between what's required in the career, but also having enough time and space for themselves so that they can sort of rest and recharge and be ready to work and not, not be just sort of running on empty all of the time. Mm -hmm. I also uh, work with people who are in job search. And you know a lot of people that I work with have not looked for a job in a long time. So obviously with everything that's going on with COVID, a lot of times people have been working for 10 or 20 or even 30 years for the same company, or maybe they never really had to look for a job that that people approached them or they were able to get jobs without looking through the online job boards. And so I help people understand the whole process, how to package themselves and how to be um, prepared to put their best foot forward when they go into uh, the, the um, job search process. And then the last group of people that I work with are people that maybe are in a role and they just feel like they're not sure they want to keep doing what they've been doing. And a lot of times people get this sort of little feeling that I want to do something different, but I'm not sure what I'm qualified for. So I will help them take a look at their skill sets and look for those transferable skills while at the same time looking inside of themselves to say, what do you really want to do? Because a lot of times people 
they might know what they want to do, but they're fearful about taking action because they're afraid they're not going to make enough money or they don't know how to go about getting a job doing that, or they're not even sure if it's a good fit or not. So I will help them take all the steps to explore things. And then, you know, if they decide on a particular path to go down that path to get a job that is one that not only can they be successful in, but they will be more satisfied. Oh, Bria, thank you so much for that. Now, talking about skills, so what can you do for me in terms of networking skills and also facilitating our effective meetings? Um, well, first of all, with networking, I always think about networking as, you know, it's, it's a, um, a reciprocal activity. Meaning that, you know, I know a lot of times, especially when people are in job search, they feel a little awkward about networking because they feel like they're, they're putting themselves in a vulnerable position to ask someone who sometimes they might not know to help them. And I, um, you know, I, I advise people to always make it reciprocal, meaning that, yes, you may be asking somebody for something, like maybe you want to find out what their job is like, or you may want them to introduce you to someone or tell you whether, you know, what it's like working at their company or whether they have job openings, but always be grateful and curious about that person's situation and offer up something in return. So, you know, a lot of times people might not be in a position to need something from you, but that doesn't mean sometime in the future they may, they may not. And, you know, I even say, um, you know, a lot of times someone who's just getting out of college or maybe even someone who's in college looking for an internship or something like that, they can't imagine what a 50-year-old executive would ever need from them. But That's what right. I say is you never know what people may need. For example, mm -hmm. a 50-year-old executive may have um, a child who's getting ready to go to university, and that child may want to know what it's like to go to the college that um, that person goes to. And so, you know, just by offering, they say they may say something like, oh, yeah, well, would you mind having a conversation with my daughter to tell her what it's like, you know, going there or what that major is like or something like that. So, you know, don't ever think that you don't have something to offer because we never know what other people need. Um, so mm, the other thing right. that you asked me about is how to run a successful meeting. So the most important yeah. thing about running successful meetings is being clear about what the objective is. Um, ideally, there would be an agenda that would be put together beforehand um, with the topics that are going to be covered and the people that are going to be addressing those things. And the agenda would be sent out to all of the media in 10 days beforehand with um, a message that, you know, there's an expectation that they're going to prepare before the meeting to come in and address whatever the agenda topics are. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that's made in meetings is that people just think like, oh, well, let's just all you know, get in a room and we'll figure it out. Well, if you don't have, it's sort of like going on a journey without having a destination and a roadmap. So, you know, if you're just getting a bunch of people in the room, well, well why are we even here? And, you know, a lot of times when um, companies have a culture of not running effective meetings, it gets to a point where people just stop coming to meetings. You know, sure. or, you know, hours are spent in a meeting that could have taken 15 or 20 minutes had had the time been used wisely. Oh, great. Absolutely. Now, so what coaching programs um, do you offer for your clients? Do you have? Um, my coaching programs are um, customized to oh. my uh, to each client. Typically, I'll start out working with somebody over 12 weeks oh. and um What's included in that is us getting clarity around what their goals are, um, building that roadmap of how we're going to get between here and there, um, identifying and starting to develop skills that are going to help them get there. Um, I also help them, I, I call this um, providing um, environments. So I, I give them a safe space to talk about things that might be difficult to talk about, because a lot of times if people are, are unhappy with work, you know, maybe they've sort of complained to their friends and family for a while, or maybe they feel like they can't talk to people about it. So giving someone a safe space to talk about the issues 
um, also uh, being the person to help them put their thoughts into action. So, you know, um, committing to their actions, being held accountable, celebrating their achievements. This is something that we do within coaching. And then um, the third part of the environments, and I think this is one that a lot of people value very much, is helping to kind of decipher what's going on from a political standpoint at work. Because as we know, there's anytime you get more than two people together, there's going to be some politics. That's right. And a lot of times in the workplace, people you know, are very confused about the office politics. Like they don't know what's going on or what, you know, people seem to be getting ahead or getting favorable treatment. And, and I will help them sort of figure out what's going on. And I, I will tell you, a lot of people will say, I don't want to have anything to do with office politics, which I understand. I mean, it turns a lot of people's stomachs, but um, if you can sort of like step back from it and realize that when you understand what's going on around you, you can have influence in the organization. And otherwise, you're sort of a victim right. of just of, you know, what's going on around you. And then the, the yes, last thing that I work with people on is mindset. So, yes. you know, many times when people have big goals, that it's, it's very natural to be fearful or to you know, want to avoid taking action because, or to worry about things that are going to happen. And you know, anytime that we're, we're worrying or being fearful or avoiding, we're actually taking energy away from action that could get us a few steps closer to the goal. So I just try to keep people focused, try to plug any, you know, any leaks of energy into you know, negative thoughts and just keep people focused and positive. Oh, great. Thank you so much, um, Terry Maxwell, for that, you know, brilliant exposure. Now, how can I take control of my um, professional destiny? Um, perfection. And what was the second thing? I'm sorry. Yeah. How can I take control or how can someone take control of their professional destiny? Oh, their professional destiny. Um, you know, I think it really goes back to what I was saying is like getting clear on what it is that you want. And, you know, if I have seen, you know, patterns that I think stand in the way of people um, taking control of their uh, professional destiny, I think it's when they sort of give up responsibility for what goes on in their career. Like they may say like, oh, well, it's up to my boss to, to promote me. And while that is true, we can advocate for ourselves. Mm. And I've seen it quite often where, you know, somebody works at a company and they they're very close with their boss and they just, you know, they just do a lot of what the boss says that they, they want them to do. And they don't really develop relationships within the organization. And then when the boss leaves, they're sort of stuck because, um, you know, they put all their eggs in one basket with that, that boss. And I think that, um, well, I, I'm going to give another little tip here about there's really only three ways to add value in a company. And it's that you're either helping the company make money, save money or reduce risk. Mm -hmm. And when, when you really look at what you do and you start to connect the dots between what your day-to-day -day activities are and how you're helping make money, save money or reduce risk, you can talk more um, influentially about the value that you add to the company. And I think a lot of times, um, you know, people don't think, they don't step back and see that, right? Because companies, but even I've worked with people in nonprofits too, like any organization is, you know, it runs on money, <laughs> you yeah. know, not, not to say that individual like relationship, relationships are, are important, but they're not going to save you if you're not adding value, you know? Um, and even, I've seen it That's where, right. you know, somebody is very, very well liked and that might save them for a little while, but if the company has issues and they need to cut headcount, they're going to cut people, even if they like them, if they're That's not right. helping them make money, save money or reduce risk. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, even, even if you, you know, have an administrative role or you work in accounting or, um, some area operations, 
if you really think about it, you can think about what, how what you do connects to value. And it's really important to think that way and to talk that way, both in, um, you know, when you're doing your performance reviews with your boss, you know, when you're looking at your um, accomplishments for the year, really try to um, put metrics with them. So if you can measure, you know, you can say, oh, well, this made the, this made this process easier. Well, okay. If you took that a little bit further, if it made it easier, did that mean that, you know, somebody had to spend less time on it? Well, how much is that person's time worth? you're actually saving money. That means that somebody didn't have to be hired to do this because that person could be, you know, um, refocused on another activity. So, you know, just think a little bit further out and be able to talk about yourself in terms of the value that you add. Oh, thank you so much. Once again, it's been lovely by Marvelous Stephen. Now, I've been having a worldwide discussion with Terry Matua, who is a speaker, a best-selling author, and also an executive and a career coach. Now, um, Terry, I need to ask you this. Can you identify a particular um, career challenge you have to handle for a client to be us? I'm sorry, you, there was a little lag in there. Can you repeat uh, the question? Right. So I wanted to ask you, um, can you identify a particular um, um, career challenge you had to handle for one of your clients? Um, sure. So do you want me to give you one for my client or for myself? That's right. For my um, clients. Yeah. Oh, for my clients. Yeah, I, I had one client who, when she first started working with me, she had gotten promoted from being a team leader of eight people to being the department leader of 50. Uh -huh. And you know, her style when she was uh, over the team of eight was that she called herself a player coach, right? So she she did the same function as the people on her team, but you know, she was just the manager. And when people on her team had issues, she would jump in, she might take work off their plate, you know, she was helping them very hands-on. Well, when she moved into the role where she had 50 people under her, when she first started working with me, she said, I've been working 70 hours a week. I am so stressed out. You know, I never get to see my kids. I take work home on the weekends. I'm so busy during the week. I don't even have time to do my own work. And so what we did was we really started looking at leverage points. Like what could she do to use the, the power that she had as the head of the department to use all of the resources at her disposal so that she didn't have to work 70 hours a week. I mean, when you have 50 people um, and a team, you know, you can delegate, you can have systems built. And so um, just some simple things that she did was um, she really felt strongly about having the open door policy. So her door was open all day long to her office and people were coming in all day long. So she never had time to do her own work. And I said, that was one of the first things that we did is I said, why don't you close your door for two hours a day so you can get your own work done? Mm -hmm. And you know, at first she felt bad because she wants to be very helpful. She's very mm -hmm. much like a servant leader type person. But, I, but what she found was that when her door was closed that people started learning to solve their own problems. Um, and, yes. you know, one of the things that I'll tell people a lot of times is don't be the, don't be the path of least resistance, you know, because people are very capable, but if they can just come to you and get you to solve their problem, they'll do that. But if you put some boundaries up and you say, you know, why don't you go try that first yourself, oh, or why don't right. you go ask a colleague how they did it? Um, you know, and, and I think that one of the things that leaders have to understand is that their time is more valuable than the people under them. And so even to spend five minutes teaching somebody something that somebody else on the team could teach them is, that's very expensive. Um, so over time, she did, uh, you know, her, her number of hours went down to more like 50 instead of 70 hours. She was taking less home, less work home. Um, she had built systems. She had pushed a lot of, um, just as an example, one of the things that you know, she sort of complained about was that um, the, the leaders that reported to her, that they all did their reports that she needed to sort of like put together into a bigger report differently. So she put 
standards in place and pushed it back on them and said, this is how I want you to do it. So, she, you know, it was really about communicating more clearly what her expectations were. And so it really was a lot of small things and putting some boundaries up that allowed her to take control right. of, of her day. That's yeah. That's yeah. right. It's very important for us to set the elder boundary in relationships. Very important. Yeah. Thank you once again yeah. for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Now, uh, let's get to your book. Um, so what important career and, and success lessons can people get from your book, um, Winning the Game of Work? Well, you know, I think one of the important lessons is that when people have goals, a lot of times um, they will sort of have this mental thought that, they've got to take a giant leap to get there. For example, I mean, in, in the book, I use this um, analogy that, that people kind of think, oh, I have this big goal, so therefore I have to you know, leap off a cliff, like do a swan, swan dive off a cliff. And when you frame it that way, of course it's scary and you're not going to want to take action because it seems very risky. But what I, um, what I encourage people to do is to break down their goals into the smallest first step that you can take where you couldn't fail. So it could start off with, well, maybe I should Google this, or maybe I have a friend who does this thing. Why don't I call them and ask them what it's like working in that area or, you know, what they had to do to start their MBA program. You know, it doesn't have to be like, okay, you're just going to like make the decision and take a giant leap. Um, small steps, will get there, get you there a lot of times faster than, you know, giant leaps of faith because it's that's so intimidating. Right. So, that's right. Something like um, little drops of water make a mighty ocean. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you once again. Now, going by one of your quotes now, I want to uh, I want to remind you in that you once said that if you're not um, satisfied, I mean, if you're not satisfied with your career, you may be playing by the wrong rules. Now, how do you mean yes. by this? Um, what I mean is that work is a game, okay? It's not, a lot of times people go into uh -huh. the workplace thinking that whatever got them the job, so, and a lot of times it's success in, in school, that they just have to keep doing the same thing that they did in school, which in school, mm -hmm. you know, like when we're in class, the teacher gives everybody the same assignment and, and uh, he or she has you know, certain expectations of what they want to see, and they grade everybody pretty much the same way. There's like an answer key. But when you go into the workplace, it's not like that. And each person has a different job. And you really need to um, go back and, like I was saying, look at how you can add value. And especially when you move up, you're going to get less and less direction. And so you've got to figure out how to navigate on your own. Absolutely. And, um, you know, if you, if you continue to sort of, and I will say also, like, as people move into leadership positions, um, you know, you need to switch, you know, where you focus from, you know, looking at somebody externally to say, oh, I want them to value, validate me, you know, like, oh, I mean, when we're growing up, it's our parents. We look to our parents to, to validate us and say, oh yes, you're doing the right thing. And then when we That's get right. in school, it's the teachers. And early in your career, of course, you know, you hope to have a boss that's going to tell you whether you're doing a good job or not. That's but right. as, you, as you move up, you have to do that for yourself. Mm. You really have to be able to sort of look around you and see like what needs to be done here. And, um, you know, you have to develop your own strategy for how you're going to navigate. And mm. I mean, a lot of the questions that you've asked me really play into that, like, you know, being in, in control of your own destiny. You know, right. we can expect a lot of times that, oh, my boss is going to look out for me. Well, guess what? Your boss is looking out for themselves. That's and right. as much as, um, as much as even if you have a fantastic boss that really does care they have their own job to do and they probably have a lot of other people that are reporting to them. So they're, they're not going to be as focused on your career as you need to be. And mm -hmm. so, you know, kind of being able to see the, the lay of the land and the rules of the game is going to allow you to play it in a way that you can win. 
Oh, great. Thank you once again for that brilliant explanation. <laughs> <laughs> now, so how can uh, we get your book? Um, my book is available on Amazon and across the entire world. And uh, it's also available on Barnes mm. & Noble. Mm, great. All right. So do you have any projects you're working on? Uh, I'm sorry. Do you have any projects you're working on? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, um, I actually just launched a uh, podcast called Marketing Mambo. And uh, I talk with people who I, I say I cha-cha chat with mm. um, movers and shakers <laughs> in the world of marketing. So oh, because I worked in marketing for so many years and I actually, I don't only work with marketers from a um, coaching standpoint, but I do mm. work with a lot of marketers because mm. they know, I know the, the world that they, mm. you know, that they're working in. Um, so actually I'll just kind of give you a, a moment of uh, what the inspiration was. I was actually talking with my, one of my clients a few weeks ago and we just sort of just got off on this, this conversation about kind of a trend and marketing around the, the intersection of marketing and technology. And it was just such an interesting conversation. And I just realized I know so many really smart, interesting people in marketing. And I love the conversation so much. I just decided to start a podcast so that I could record and share these interesting conversations with um, you know the world at large, whether they work in marketing or just kind of interested in, in hearing wow. about marketing. That's right. No knowledge is wasted. <laughs> Don't you think yeah, so? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I wish you best of luck in that project. Oh, thank you. All right. So thank you once again for coming to the show. I hope some other time we can do this again. Yes, I, I enjoyed it a lot, Alma Bolo. All right. Thank you once again. It's Milawa Lipa Mabala, Stephen. I know some other time. I needed to say so always. And also, you need to live life and live fully. It's bye for now. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Life Well Lived by Amabala Stephen. It's an engaging and enlightening talk show on life, relationships, and the business of life. Grab a cup of juice and just chill. Life Well Lived by Amabala Stephen. Live life. Live fully. I got tons of soul on my true collective ball. Famous, so, so famous, number one, desirable. I do what I want, when I want, and how I want it. Leave you with the one in the air, that's how I roll. I got tons of soul on my true collective ball. Famous, so, so famous, number one, desirable.